Hello, everybody. Welcome to Onboarding Doesn't Have to Suck. We are so excited to have you join us here today. Now, before we get started, allow us to introduce ourselves. My name is Adriana Villela, and I am a CNCF ambassador. I am a HashiCorp ambassador for the third year in a row. Um, I'm a blogger, a podcaster, and I do have a day job. By day, I am a senior staff developer advocate, and I focus most of my time on the Open Telemetry Project, and this is actually my second open source summit, so I'm super excited to be here. Um, I work as part of the Open Telemetry end user SIG, and by night, I like to climb walls, and I also love capybaras, which fill my Instagram feed, and I do not apologize for that because they are very cute animals. And hey, y'all, my name is Ana Margarita Medina. I have the pleasure of working alongside Adriana, also as a senior staff developer advocate. I love contributing to open source. I'm part of the Kubernetes release team, also part of the Kubernetes code of conduct, and I'm on the GC for a CNCF project called Captain, where we also work with delivery. And when you don't find me near the computers, you can find me near the ocean or cooking a lot of Latin food or having some fun with makeup looks. We're very excited to be here today and get to talk to you all a little bit more about how to make onboarding better. And first up, we have something prepared for you all to see. Hello, Adriana. What's happening? Welcome to your new job. Ooh, thank you so much, Anna. Happy to be here. You should have received your new laptop by now. After I explain HR policies and procedures, you will go ahead and join Bob, Milton, and Peter in a Zoom call for tech onboarding over the next two days. There, you and your classmates will sit and install the company's blessed tools on your devices. It's mandatory attendance. If you can be there by 9 a.m., that would be great. Wait, we're going to be installing things manually? Yeah, of course. We have always done it this way. Do you have a problem with it? Well, that'll take days and I kind of have this really nice automation set up with Ansible to install all my tools. Yeah, that's nice. But you can't do that here. Go ahead and keep that for your personal laptop. We have our allowed set of tools and you can't deviate from that because we need to stick with corporate compliance rules. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hopefully this, this scenario is a little bit familiar to you, but also hopefully not. We love office space and we wanted to put something fun together on like the corporate fun of having to sit through mandatory one week or two week onboarding sessions because none of us like that and we really want to provide value soon. So with that, we want to talk a little bit about the developer challenges. We know that onboarding can be really challenging and stressful. After all, you're starting a new job, you're coming on to new procedures, new policies, and that's also a new tech stack that you're having to onboard to. And that comes with a really high steep learning curve at times as you're trying to navigate all the things and figure out who to talk to and what tool is for what, like how do you even look at your paycheck? And couple that with the fact that you're coming into some organizations that somehow don't have streamlined processes for onboarding, that can really make the onboarding experience really time consuming. But when we talk about onboarding, we are gonna focus today on developer onboarding. But one of the things is that we're not just regular employees, we're focusing on working with different tools in order to make things better. And somehow, our, sometimes our companies just give us base images and our computers of like the normal things that you need for your day to day, but that doesn't mean that it's our day to day. But we wanted to touch base and talk a little bit about those first initial tools. First, we have our browser, something like Chrome might already come installed. We have our email client, something like Outlook might be set up, some productivity tools such as Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint. And we can't forget our communication tools such as Microsoft Teams and Slack. Also can't forget our video conferencing software such as Zoom. And lastly, have to make our security teams happy with, like, with the software such as VPNs. 
and the developer experience is gonna vary very much on the type of company that you're at. So we've narrowed it down to three different types of environments that you might be in your organization. We start with the vault. In this scenario, basically developers can only install the software that is allowable by the organization. And it's usually managed by a security team and you need special approvals to get new software added to the list of approved software. Um, and this is common in organizations that are dealing with um, that where security and com compliance are super important because they're dealing with extremely sensitive data. And you might see this in uh, financial institutions and healthcare institutions. One of the other onboarding experiences that we have is what we like to call the red tape tango. This is where developers are allowed to install software on their machines, but they have to go through whitelisting processes to bring software in. And this process might take so much more time. It might not be the vault, but you might be stuck waiting for something installed for a few months or even just going through pricing uh, approvals. And this is common organizations that need some compliance and some high security, but there is a lot more wiggle room and it's nothing like the vault. Examples of this include things like SaaS companies and consulting companies. And finally, we've got the wild, wild west where everything is a free for all and you can install whatever the heck you want on your machine when you want, which sounds awesome. Now these companies do lack policies and procedures and security really isn't super important to them, at least not yet. And you tend to see this in organizations that are starting up, such as small startups. Now, all that said, you might be wondering, okay, what exactly goes into, uh, what kind of developer tooling are we looking for, right? So there are a few things. This is not an exhaustive list. These are the basics. So first of all, you're writing code. So say you're writing Go code, you need a Go compiler. You're writing Python code, you need that interpreter, so you need your software development kits or SDKs, you need somewhere to write the code to make it beautiful, so you would want your integrated development environment or IDE along with your favorite plugins. In addition to that, we're developers, we like our terminals, we have our favorite shells, we have our favorite shell configurations, so we'll probably want that. And because we're writing code, we want to version control our code, so it's probably a good idea to have Git installed on our machines. Along with that, maybe there are some additional tools that we like to use that our team needs to use, right? So if you work in the cloud, maybe Google Cloud, use the G Cloud CLI or Azure's AZ CLI if you use Azure or perhaps you use Kubernetes, so you need kubectl installed. And perhaps you might be doing some virtualization work, so you might want to have VirtualBox installed or maybe Docker. And finally, some additional tooling such as Homebrew or OpenSSL. Now, wouldn't it be so super nice to be able to install these things relatively quickly with the click of a button? Now, fortunately, platform engineering can do that for us. Now, there are many definitions of platform engineering out there. Everyone's got their opinions, and so do we. And we're going to subject you to our opinion of what we think platform engineering is. It's, it's our favorite definition of platform engineering, where we basically see it as a natural extension, uh, a natural step in the evolution of DevOps. Now, DevOps basically gives us those fundamental principles of collaboration, codifying all the things, automating all the things, and having fast feedback loops. Then we have Site Reliability Engineering, or SRE, which we see as an extension of DevOps with the added concern of focus on customer impact and reliability. And then finally, we have platform engineering, which in itself is an extension of SRE, where we also have the same concerns as, as SRE, but we also care about the internal customer, i.e. the developer. Now, one of the aspects of platform engineering is DevX or development experience, and this is what we're going to be focusing on today. Now, but what is developer experience? So developer experience or DevX is all about how developers feel, think, and value what they do. But you might be wondering, okay, who cares? Why is this important? We did some research and found a study published in ACMQ. 
next slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, where it talks about the fact that developers who find their tools and work processes intuitive and easy to use feel that they're 50% more innovative compared to those that don't ha that those that have opaque or hard to understand processes. Unintuitive tools and processes can be both be a time sink and a source of frustration. In either case, this is a severe hindrance to the individuals or team's creativity. This means that DevX is actually really important and it matters because it impacts the productivity that our developers are having, but it also uh, uh, means that it affects satisfaction and this includes retention of employees at the company. This study also reads that there is a difference between simply writing code and writing code in an environment that is optimized for writing code. Environments that are optimized for writing code are efficient, effective, and conductive to well-being. And these rely on the right mix of tools, practices, processes, and social structures. So we really want to make sure that we keep DevX in mind as we go through our onboarding experience. If you want to take a look at this study, which has so much more other content than just what we're touching on today, feel free to scan the QR code. And when you're starting out, there's a few things that I think you need to keep in mind when you're building your developer onboarding experience. First, you need to keep in mind security or flexibility. You also have to keep in mind dependency management and also ask yourself, what is the time to value that you have for these projects? So go through these columns and ask yourself your questions as you're trying to figure out what developer experience to bring to your organization. But the best thing is that with platform engineering, you actually don't have to choose one column or just two columns and concentrate on those. Platform engineering allows for you to leverage all three columns and still reach the goals that you have for your projects. So how is it that we can get that done? Well, first we're gonna look at developer environment setups and we're gonna go through two experiences that you can have. The first one that we have is a self-contained developer environment setup where the developer machine just has base, base tooling only. And this means a developer can actually access their tools via containerized or virtualized environments. So this is something that's gonna be running either locally or on the cloud or a combination of both like a dev container and you're connecting to it through a local IDE. Some examples of this tool include things like GitHub code spaces or Vagrant. And then we have self-contained, oh, sorry, we have local install environments. So this differs from the self-contained environment because whereas with the self-contained environment, you can pretty much get away with having a dumb terminal and you're running all your, all your tools elsewhere, i.e. the cloud, um, you actually need to ensure that you have a beefy enough machine to be able to support the tools that you're running. So in this case, you want to uh, make sure that you have enough compute power, you need to have enough storage space. Um, and this is where it would be super handy when you're setting up these kinds of machines to uh, use a configuration management tool such as Ansible to install and configure your tools because guess what? Just like we used Ansible to configure our lovely servers um, for production, we can use it for our local dev machines. Now, um, you might be wondering, okay, what are some of the tools that might make this possible? And we've, um, we're listing a few here. This is not an exhaustive list. We're listing them alphabetically. So we have Ansible, Backstage, DevPod, GitHub Code Spaces, Credix, Port, and Vagrant. Now, you might be looking at these tools and thinking, okay, well, some of these do similar things, some of these overlap, and yes, absolutely true. This matrix gives you an idea of what the capabilities are for each of these tools, and the cool thing is you can uh, use a lot of these tools in concert with each other, so they can, you can daisy chain them together to help you achieve a lovely developer onboarding experience. And what we're going to do next is basically give you two sample developer onboarding workflows. The first one that we're gonna be looking at is a self-contained developer environment setup. In this case, we're gonna be leveraging something like GitHub Code Spaces to go about it. With GitHub, GitHub Code Spaces, the platform engineering team is in charge of having that environment set up and having those configurations inside the repos. The nice thing with GitHub Code Spaces is that environments can actually just be spun up really easily and they can be brought down just as quickly. And since the environment is remote, you actually don't need a whole bunch of compute power in your computer to access this GitHub Code Spaces, which helps a lot. 
Um, same thing with storage space or even having any developer tool installed in your local machine. The trade-off here is that you actually might need to have different code spaces for different projects and just in general for different branches. So the developer is going to arrive on onboarding day ready to get started on coding and they're going to go through the wiki, they're going to read all those processes and in that flow they'll find a link to a GitHub repo for the projects that they're assigned. They're able to go to that GitHub repo and open the code in GitHub code spaces on your local ID. It's just going to be spun up. This means that they're able to start searching through the code base and start contributing just on day one if they want. They'll be able to put it that PR on day one, which is great. It's what we want, that time to value. And then the next sample workflow is our local onboarding workflow. So as I mentioned earlier, this is the scenario where you'll want a beefier laptop because you're installing all of the tools locally. Now, even though you do have to deal with having to make sure that you have a sufficiently powerful laptop, it does mean that all the tools are available to you. So you don't necessarily need a network connect connection to be able to access all of them, which is a bonus. So in this workflow, we basically have our developer who then goes off and goes to an onboarding portal and they say, okay, let's start the onboarding process. The onboarding portal, which can be a tool like Backstage, which is a, an open source tool, CNCF. Um, it has a SaaS offering with, uh, through roadie.io. Um, or it could be Port, which is also a paid SaaS offering. So that tool will go off and it will kick off a GitHub action. And that GitHub action will then run an Ansible playbook which will go off and install your various tools and set up permissions for those tools and maybe permissions for other systems. Now, you can easily replace GitHub Actions with some other CI CD tool. You can easily replace Ansible with some other configuration management tool. Now, on top of that, if the developer decides, hey, you know, it'd be nice to have some other tools installed on my machine, as long as they're part of the blessed tool set from the company, they can go to the developer portal again and say, hey, I want to install these extra tools here. And so it'll kick off the GitHub Actions once again, and then that'll kick off the Ansible playbook, and away we go and install the tools onto the machine. And voila. So there we have it. Now, before we uh, finish off, we are going to leave you with some lovely tips and tricks uh, for enhancing your developer onboarding experience. So first off, keep balance in mind. What kind of organization are you? Are you a vault? Are you a red tape tango? Or are you a wild, wild west? It really depends on what your security and compliance needs are. In addition to that, you need to make the decision. What kind of uh, environment do you wanna provide for your developers? Do you want a local install environment or do you want a self-contained environment? Perhaps it'll be a combination of both and that's totally okay as well. It's not one size fits all. And we also have to remember that DevX is never done. You always want to seek for that continuous improvement. So just as you're doing the onboarding experience, run a survey with your newly hired engineers just to see how that experience was setting up the tools and anything else that they might be needed. But we also say that this is something that extends to the rest of the year. So we say to run a survey one or twice a year where you're asking your developers how that experience is going, how it's like to contribute and collaborate with other engineers. And you might have some insights on finding out that it may take 30 minutes right now to build your code repo and you might need to do some cleanup on that. So you always want to keep a pulse on that. We also say that you never want to work in isolation. DevX is a team sport, so it starts off with having contact with your InfoSec team to make sure your security considerations are going on and you're auditing the tools that you're bringing in. You also want to work with developers to understand what type of toolings they're still needing or what else is missing in your organization. And we also say to talk to other engineers outside your organization that work in platform engineering to try to understand any other tips or what else is going on in the market and extend that to outside your organization as well. And finally, don't forget the humans. Remember that it is humans that are coming in to work in your organization, at least for now, until the evil AI overlords take over. <laughs> So that means that it's super helpful to have a buddy system whereby you pair a 
seasoned employee with a newbie so that they have someone to go to to ask questions as part of their onboarding process. On top of that, chances are you're onboarding with other folks from your organization, and it means that they're probably not all developers. Guess what? Make friends with them. You never know when those relationships might come in handy. And finally, make sure that you have a place where all your new hires can come in and have some chit chat because you know what? The one thing that y'all have in common is that you're new to the organization and it's a little scary and overwhelming and creating a safe space for them goes a really long way. Now, before we wrap up, here are some handy resources and some shameless self-promotion. First off, we have a blog post version of this talk that has just been published. Um, on top of that, uh, there is a link to the study that Anna had mentioned earlier. Um, if you are looking to see what it's like to use Ansible to install developer tools on your machine, I have an open source repo that I have used for my personal uh, laptop many a time to install tools and it has saved me a lot of time. Um, if you wanna see how a tool like Vagrant can be used to provision an environment, check out this open source tool called HashiCube, which basically installs uh, HashiCorp, Console, Vault, and Nomad in a Docker container using Vagrant. And finally, I have a podcast, it's called Geeking Out. I'm wearing a t-shirt designed by my daughter. Um, past guests have included Kelsey Hightower, Charity Majors, Hazel Weekly, this week, Anna is on the episode giving some hot tips on getting your CFP talks accepted. And we also used to have a podcast together called On Call Me Maybe. Uh, it was two glorious seasons, but it came to an end way too, uh, way too soon. But, you know, the episodes are still out there in the interwebs, so definitely check them out. We also hope you enjoy the sea otter images. We're not great designers, but we're great prompt engineers. So we want to say a big thank you to our AI overload for this project, Bing AI powered by Dolly3, to create the sea otters that you saw today. And with that, we want to say thank you all very much for sticking for our talk. We're signing off with peace, love, and code.